what's your computer setup? What uh, what's like the perfect? Do you, are you somebody that's flexible to no matter what laptop, four screens? Yeah. Uh, or do, do you uh, prefer a certain setup that you're most productive? Um, I guess the one that I'm uh, familiar with is one large screen, uh, 27 inch, um, and uh, my laptop on the side. What operating system? I do Max. That's my primary. For all tasks. I would say OS X, but when you're working on deep learning, everything is Linux. You're SSH'd into a cluster and you're working remotely. But what about the actual development, like they're using the IDE? So yeah, that's... you would use, uh, I think a good way is you just run VS Code, um, my favorite editor right now on your Mac, uh, but you are actually, you have a remote folder through SSH. Um, so the actual files that you're manipulating are on the cluster somewhere else. So what's the best IDE? Uh, VS Code, what else do people use? So I use Emacs. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Still, it's cool. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it may be cool. I don't know if it's maximum productivity. Um, so, what what do you recommend in terms of editors? You, you worked with a lot of software engineers, editors for Python, C plus plus machine machine learning applications. Uh, I think the current answer is VS Code. Currently, I believe that's the best um, IDE. It's got a huge amount of extensions. It has a GitHub Copilot um, uh, integration which I think is very valuable. What do you think about the, the Copilot integration? I was actually, uh, I got to talk a bunch with Guido and Rossum, who's a creator of Python, and he loves Copilot. He like, he yep. programs a lot with it. Yep. Uh, do you? Yeah, I use Copilot, I love it. And uh, it's free for me, but I would pay for it. Yeah, I think it's very good. And the utility that I found with it was, is in, is in, I would say there is a learning curve and you need to figure out when it's helpful and when to pay attention to its outputs Mm -hmm. and when it's not going to be helpful, where you should not pay attention to it. Because if you're just reading its suggestions all the time, it's not a good way of interacting with it. But I think I was able to sort of like mold myself to it. I find it's very helpful, number one, in uh, copy, paste, and replace some parts. So I don't, um, when the pattern is clear, it's really good at completing the pattern. And number two, sometimes it suggests APIs that I'm not aware of. Uh, so it, it tells you about something that you didn't know. So And that's an opportunity to discover a new It's idea. an opportunity to... So you, I would never take Copilot code as given. I almost always uh, copy a copy paste into a Google search and you see what this function is doing. And then you're like, oh, it's actually actually exactly what I need. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Copilot. So you learn something. So it's in part a search engine, a part um, maybe getting the exact syntax correctly that yeah. once you see it, yeah. It's that NP hard thing. It's like once you see it, you know yes, exactly. it's correct. Exactly. But you yourself you can verify. struggle. You can verify efficiently, but you yes. you can't generate efficiently. Yeah. And Copilot really, I mean it's it's autopilot for programming, right? And currently is doing the lane following, which is like the simple copy paste and sometimes suggest. Uh, but over time it's going to become more and more autonomous. And so the same thing will play out in not just coding, but actually across many, many different things, probably. But coding is an important one, right? Like right. writing programs. Yeah. What? How do you see the future of that developing, uh, the program synthesis, like being able to write programs that are more and more complicated? Because right now, it's human supervised in yeah. interesting ways. Yes. Like what? It feels like the transition will be very painful. My mental model for it is the same thing will happen as with the autopilot. Uh, so currently it's doing lane following, it's doing some simple stuff, mm-hmm. and eventually we'll be doing autonomy and people will have to intervene less and less. And there could be like you, like testing mechanisms, like if it writes a function and that function looks pretty damn correct, but how do you know it's correct? Because you're like getting lazier and lazier as a programmer, <laughs> like your ability to, because like little yep. bugs, but I guess it won't make little No, mistakes. it will. It, it, Copilot will make uh, off by one subtle bugs. It has done that to me. But do you think future systems will? Or is, is it really the off by one is actually a fundamental challenge of programming? In, in that case, it wasn't fundamental and I think things can improve. But uh, yeah, I think humans have to supervise. I am nervous about people not supervising what comes out and uh, what happens to, for example, the proliferation of bugs in all of our systems. I'm nervous about that, but I think there will probably be some other copilots for bug finding and stuff like that at some point. Because <laughs> there will be like a lot more automation for- uh, Oh man. <laughs> so it's like a, a program, uh, a copilot that generates a compiler, pr- one that does a linter, yes, one that does like a a, a type checker. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a committee of like a GPT sort of like, and then there'll be like a manager for the committee. Yeah, and then there'll be somebody that says a new version of this is needed. Yeah. We need to regenerate it. Yeah, there were ten GPTs that were forwarded and gave fifty suggestions. Another yeah. one looked at it and picked the few that they like. A bug one looked at it and it was like, it's probably a bug. They got re-ranked by some other thing. 
and then a final ensemble uh, GPT comes in and is like, okay, given everything you guys have told me, this is probably the next token. <laughs> you know, the feeling is the number of programmers in the world has been growing and growing very quickly. Yep. Do you think it's possible that it'll actually level out and drop to like a very low number with this kind of world? Because then you'll be doing software 2.0 programming um, and you'll be doing this kind of generation of copilot type systems programming, but you won't be doing the old school so software 1.0 program. I don't currently think that they're just going to uh, replace human programmers. Um, it's I'm so hesitant saying stuff like this, right? Yeah, because this, <laughs> this is going to be replaced in five years. I mean, no, it's going to show that like this is where we thought. Because I I agree with you, but I think we might be very surprised, right? Like, what what are the next? I I, I what's your sense of where we stand with language models? Like, does it feel like the mm -hmm. beginning or the middle? Or the end? The beginning, 100%. I think the big question in my mind is, for sure, GPT will be able to program quite well, competently, and so on. Yeah. How do you steer the system? You still have to provide some guidance to what you actually are looking for. And so how do you steer it? And how do you say, how do you talk to it? How do you um, audit it and verify that what is done is correct? And how do you like work with this? And it's as much not just an AI problem, but a UI UX problem. Yeah. Um, so beautiful, fertile ground for so much interesting work uh, for VS Code plus plus, where you're not just it's not just human programming anymore. It's amazing. Yeah, so you're interacting with the system. So not just one prompt, but it's iterative prompting. Yeah, and you're trying to figure out having a conversation with the system. Yeah, that actually, I mean, to me, that's super exciting to have a conversation with the program I'm writing. Yeah, yeah maybe at some point uh, you're just conversing with it. It's like, okay, here's what I want to do. Actually, this variable, maybe it's not even that low level as variable, but mm -hmm. you can also imagine like. Can you translate this to C++ and back to Python? And yeah, back that already to... kind of exists in some No, but ways. just like doing it as part of the program experience. Like, I think I'd like to write this function in C++. Mm. As, or, or like, you just keep changing for different uh, yeah. different programs because they have different syntax, syntax. Maybe I want to convert this into a functional language. Yep. And so like, you get to become multilingual yep. as a programmer and dance back and forth efficiently. Yeah. I mean, I think the UI UX, UX of it, though, is like still very hard to think through yeah. because it's not just about writing code on a page. You have an entire developer environment. You have a bunch of hardware on it. Uh, you have some environmental variables. You have some scripts that are running in a cron job. Like, there's a lot going on to like working with computers and how do these uh, systems set up environment flags and work across multiple machines and set up screen sessions and automate different processes. Like, how all that works and is auditable by humans and so on is like massive question in my mind.